Jerry, uh, Jerry has been working on uh, a uh, version of Consensus All that we call Consensus Short. It has the same sort of idea as Consensus All, except it's designed to produce hourly forecast output using what we currently have available uh, in a short term on format ensemble, if you will. Uh, since this is the winter uh, science sharing series, uh, we're going to focus on hourly snow forecast. And naturally, uh, when we scheduled this, we expected to have lots of snow events to show you examples of. And so we basically, it's only snowed a couple times. So that's Mother Nature for you. Next slide. OK, so here's the outline of we'll do some background information. Again, reviewing the observations, which are one of the uh, backbones to spinning up uh, the short-term forecast, the models that we use, uh, the, the manner that Jerry blends the current observations into the model consensus, uh, and that includes a nowcast feature, which we'll talk about. And then the one of the few uh, storms we have to look at is the December 20th and 21st blizzard uh, that uh, had affected a very large area, but it included our CWA. I'm going to show you examples of the six-hour snow uh, amounts that is our typical workhorse, six-hour QPF and six-hour snow, but also the hourly pop and the hourly snow forecast that were generated by the consensus short next. So reviewing, and again, this the current OBS background that you have in GFE, this, this is what's in there now. Uh, when it, During the testing phase, we called it consensus OBS, but this is what everybody should have installed uh, within the last few months uh, and uh, currently running, but just wanted to go ahead and make sure everyone was familiar with it. We use five background fields, so we uh, use the same consensus approach that we use on models to the observation fields. Ideally, we would just take the RTMA 100% and not adjust it, but that uh, the verification task force uh, came up with this as a compromise. Uh, you have a portion of laps. The, uh, RAP, which is still called the RUC-13 and GFE and uh, AWIPS, the HER, the RTMA at five kilometers, and then you know, at some point we're going to, of course, go to two and a half kilometers. And the NAM-12, uh, there's been some discussion about possibly using the NAM DNG, the downscaled five kilometer version of the NAM, but uh, we haven't done that at this point. Next. So the, the consensus product for each parameter is run every hour. And we uh, go out 24 hours for the, these following elements. As you can see, temperature, dew point, RH, wind and wind gust, sky, pop, QPF, and snow amount. Uh, then Jerry also generates three, six, and 12 hourly elements for the pop, QPF, and snow amount. Next. Some of these slides are very data dense. But uh, here is the composition in general of consensus short. Uh, there's a part, and we'll get into the details in a second. There's a part official. And so we, we retain a portion of the official each hour for 24 hours. We have the observations. And we'll also discuss in detail that some of those observations are advected by the mean wind in the 850, 7, and 500 layer. Uh, it, it's not the entire layer, but it is the average of those three winds. And we do that for pop sky, QPF, and snow. And I'll show you how you would advect an ob. Uh, or we'll talk about that. There is persistence, which is the obs for all other 
parameters like temperature and dew point and wind. Uh, those are, are tweaked, though, based on uh, the seven-day mean diurnal hourly variation. So uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to replace a eight, uh, use the 17Z temperature and then adjust, put it into 18Z without adjusting it for what would typically be a small increase, say a degree or so. So the, the easiest way to do that is to look at the last seven days of hourly changes and apply that. Uh, the HER is weighted twice, kind of like we weight twice the European in our consensus all suite. Then we also use the RAP, the 2.5G lamp. We do use our local workstation wharf, only one version, a 4-kilometer ARW version. And then we use the national ARW and NMM 4-kilometer models, both the 12-kilometer NAM and the five kilometer downscaled version. And then we use what we call the adjusted lab, which is the ramp, the, the wrap or RUC 13, and, and still what we call it in GFE, adjusted by the lamp stations, much like we do the adjusted MET and adjusted MAV. Observations dominate the weightings in the first six hour of the forecast. And we'll get into that more in a second. We also have bias corrected version, which we're not going to discuss here, but it's essentially the same thing except using all the bias corrected versions. That one's a little trickier because we voice verify only produces uh, bias corrections every three hours, but Jerry has found a way to uh, account for that on an hourly basis. So it actually does a bias correction out in 24 hours. Next, so some of the gory details, just to give you an idea of how things break down. On forecast hour one for things like pop, QPF, sky, and snow, the observations, which in most cases is a combination of, of the RTMA and LAPS, and any, anything that we can get our hands on. Jerry's also experimenting with MPE from the local radar to get the current state uh, of what's happening on radar for and, and also sky cover uh, using satellite and laps and other things. So the first hour is 90% affected by the OBS, and again, those are things that are then evicted. So if you have, if in the last hour you have something, say, over Dubuque, Iowa, it's going, the, in the one-hour forecast, that blob of precip or sky cover or whatnot will be pushed an hour downstream using the mean wind at 857 and 5. So if the feature, and as we'll talk about, if the feature is not rooted, if that's not a representative motion, like we often see with aura graphics or lake effect, it, it isn't going to work out that good. So that is one negative we'll tell you about is that the, the feature has to be rooted and moving with that mean wind and that and 857.5 or else it doesn't work out too well. As you can see at hour one, the official forecast and all of the other components are just a minute fraction of the forecast. As you go out for the first few hours, you see that there's a gradual decrease in the OBS or persistence. And as you get to hour seven, in this case, for these parameters, uh, it will completely disappear. Next slide. So for temperature, dew point, wind, wind gust, the, 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 the more standard parameters, the phase out period actually is only about three hours instead of six, six or seven. Uh, and you can see that by the time you get to hour four, you have fully disposed of the OBS and you've kept, uh, per, you, you keep a portion of 
persistent or official forecast, the continuity, but you're essentially about 10 percent, 8 to 10 percent for every parameter except the HER, which is, uh, again, has a double weighting. Next. Hey, Jeff, this is Dan LaCrosse. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Hey, I'm just curious about those um, three hourly data sets. You have them in there as some weight each hour. Are you interpolating those then to get an hourly contribution, like the NAM 12, right? We get it on three hour, three hourly in GFE uh, on AWIP2. Let, let me, let I'm me, just kind of curious how we do that to get an hourly. Dan, uh, let me ask Jer Jerry. I, since I didn't want feedback, since I'm using a headset, I'll just have to ask him. Uh, Dan, Dan and Lacrosse wanted to know how you're handling the three hourly uh, data sets, and in, if you're interpolating, which is what I thought you're doing, when you have like adjusted met and there's only a three hourly field, um, why don't you just answer in the microphone? Hey everybody. So basically, what happens is um, for the temperature, dew point, and those kind of fields, I just do a um, linear interpolation. So basically, I just take the on hours and interpolate to get the off hours, and I include that as part of the average. So I use the interpolated hours as part of the average. For POP, QPF, and the time range elements, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, there's, there is some slides later on that will explain that. Um, so maybe we should just wait for that, and if we have further questions on those, um, we can jump on that at that point. Does that answer your question, Dan? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay. In the so we showed you the short term. As you go out in uh, time, you start to lose certain port parts of the data set. So I wanted to show you the impacts of that. The HER goes out uh, 15 hours, and then we lose it. So it was, you know, obviously a double weighting and then drops out. So as you get to the later portions of the forecast, uh, 16 to 18 hours, you're looking at roughly 10% uh, weighting for each, each parameter, including official. And then we lose uh, one more, the wrap, drops out at 18 hours, and then you, so the last six hours, uh, that's not part of the equation either. Next. This, uh, again, summarizes, and as Dan Baumgart brought up, not all these data sets provide one-hour resolution output. Uh, some of the, now they, they the, 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 the sad story is, obviously, the ARW, NMM, the NAM, all those do actually have hourly time steps. We just don't get them. It would be very nice to have those, uh, obviously. Uh, there's other models like the WARF, NSSL, part of the, uh, the uh, short-term ensemble of opportunity that SPC runs. They are using all the hourly output, and if we could get that, that would improve the quality of these uh, products. The length is simply how far out the model uh, runs, in most cases 24 hours or more, and the refresh, re the refresh rate or frequency simply, uh, I, official I say approximately three hour, it certainly could be more frequently than that that we update it, but uh, the ESTF proposal calls for uh, a concerted effort to update every three hours, so that's, that's the number I put there. And everything else is, there's, there's several that are updated every hour, but uh, in our case, our local workstation wharf is every three hours, and then many of these other models update every six hours. We don't necessarily get them in AWIPS or GFE every six hours, like the ARW and NMM cores, uh, I believe, are run every six hours. So I put that in there as six, but again, that's not necessarily the, the current state. It's It would be more of an ideal state. Okay, next. 
So here Jerry talks about uh, how he generates pop and, and the weighting that we use for the first six hours. Uh, so again, if precipitation is well behaved and is moving along and has a long history and the RTMA and labs are handling the hourly QPF pretty well and it's measurable, <laughs> then you will get a pretty good signal. If something's developing rapidly like convection, uh, obviously there's going to be spin-up problems, which uh, is something that we often deal with. The other, the other issue is that the even though the HER is getting better at spinning up precip, there's a roughly four to five hour delay that we'll talk about in actually getting the current run, which also causes spin up issues. So the observed precip grid uh, is advected along using the average of those 857 and 5 winds. Uh, we we don't have an hourly QPF for every model, so uh, what since this uh, pop is generated from models using QPF, uh, Jerry fragmented the grid into hourly QPF. Now that's not ideal, but there really isn't any way if 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 a model has a three-hour uh, QPF. The, the best you can do really is divide it into three and assume that it fell equally in those three periods. That isn't the case, but there really, really isn't any other way to account for it. In this case, one of the big things that you should note is the QPF uh, is not like how we generate it in consensus all. In consensus all, we we tied the pot more to the QPF amount because we were harnessing it for more of an extended forecast where there, there certainly is some relationship uh, between QPF amount and pop so that if more models are producing a quarter inch of liquid, your confidence in getting only a hundred is higher. But in the short term, that doesn't work very well because again, you only need a hundredth, so tying a hundredth uh, to in, in the way that we do a pops and extended is that you need a, a five hundredth of amount just to get a fifty pop. Seventy seventy pop would be a tenth of an inch, but in the very short term, basically you want to tie it to just a hundredth. So the the pop if if a model has a hundredth, the pop will be one hundred percent for that model. Otherwise, it will be zero which is the way our smart inits were, gener were created prior to the entire extended forecast process. This field isn't particularly smooth, so Jerry runs us smoother over that final consensus field. Next. Hey, Jeff. Yes. Yes, Phil, it's too false. Um, I got a question about that with the pop. Um, one of the things that with, like, the guidance, like the lamp and the, ma and the MAV, is that they're – they don't do their 6 and 12 hour pops the same way we do in the sense that our 6 hour pop is calibrated to 12 hours and as you go lower, if you go to 3 hour pops, it's calibrated to, to those time ranges, whereas our, 12, our 6 and 12 hour pops are more um, qualitative in the sense that you, you put your highest pop, say, at 21Z, but it's basically the, calibrated to 12 hours, if you know what I mean. and so. What ends up happening is that the lab or the met or the mat are going to have relatively low pops at at these smaller time scales at three hours and six hours, and I'm kind of wondering how that is taken into account. Um, Phil, and I apologize, I have to repeat the question to Jerry. Phil at Sioux Falls wanted to know how we account for the the different time scales of 12, 6, 3, and 1 hour pop because we do a floating pop in the weather service in general where it's not a true 1 hour pop or 3 hour pop. It's, it's kind of a marker for when the most likely precip will occur. And so he wanted to know how you're handling things like 
the three or six hour adjusted met pops because those are much lower than a 12 hour pop. He said, Jerry's answer is I don't use them. So we're, we're actually, t he's using, he, to, to get the hourly pop, he's just using QPF to generate the, so he's just dividing up the QPF that the, that the, that the MOS generates into, if it's a six hour QPF, he generates, he divides it by six and then generates the same pop for those six hours. I don't know if I'm explaining that correctly, but so we're not actually taking the three or six hour um, MOS pops, even though they're available, we're not using them. So, so to understand, you're just using the, the QPF out of the out of the models itself, and basically doing like a, a model model um, uh, probability basically a probabilistic type thing like the Shroff in, in some instance. Is that correct? He, he's saying, or are we using the, the same approach that the Shroff does basically? Just to, yes, very similar is the answer. The difference is if there is a one-hour pop, I mean, if, if If a one-hour pop is available, he uses it. Otherwise, he, I would say Jerry rigs it, but he likes me to say Jimmy Rig instead. Yeah, is, I, did I answer your question, Phil? Or yeah, that helps. Thanks. Next. Oh, it already it already is next. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so his observed grid, he found that the RTMA. If there was ever a need for a better hourly precip analysis, we definitely discovered it. Because uh, it's not, sometimes the art, the, we see really goofy stuff where there's obvious blobs of precip floating around and the RTMA is not handling. It. So he had to throw in a little bit of the her in order to get we couldn't completely use the RTMA or labs. So that's one thing if we, this will get better if we get a better hourly precip analysis to start with. So you can see the weightings again. Things are, are, are advected by the mean wind. And again, as we talked about the QPF over three or six hour periods, if, if the hourly is not available, we had to fragment it, which causes its own issues, which you'll see, you'll see the result of that by a little bit of jumpiness in the, in the fields. Jerry did his best to try to smooth those out, but it's, until we get the full resolution output from all the models, it's gonna continue to be a little jumpy. Next. Hey, um, uh, Jeff? Yes. This is Ken in Wichita. The yes, question I had was, have you had, um, I guess, enough events to see how much this might dampen out, like extreme events, this type of thing? You know what I'm asking? The answer is no. The answer is no. I don't think we've seen enough extreme events to, to uh, you know, I'm going to show you an example of a pretty extreme event here shortly. Uh, we are for the fourth biggest snowstorm ever at Madison. So I, I I'll let I'll leave that up to you to decide. Um, okay. But we need we definitely need more events. That, that, okay. That, yeah, that, I'm that, just that, curious. Because, you know, yeah, the consensus yeah. tends to dampen out the extremes and all that. I'm just kind of wondering how, how well this works compared to that. Well, yeah, I, I, I would say that the main intent of this is to provide us with some something for the short term to kind of start with. I think the biggest problem that our forecasters have had 
uh, is what what tools to use to do short-term forecasts. And so we're trying to apply what was successful in the, uh, the – I'm not going to show you the verification, but I can tell you that it's, it's the verification on, on most of these parameters is pretty outstanding. I don't have really good uh, QPF verification or snow verification yet because I'm because it doesn't it doesn't snow anymore in Wisconsin but <laughs> <laughs> try living uh, down here yeah uh, so looking at the seven to twenty four hour period of the forecast we just about equally weight the consensus of the available guidance we we've doubled the her and we're thinking about doubling the adjusted lav which is the lamp because it's one of the top performers as well. There's a heavy weight in hours one to six in the current observation, which decreases each hour until it's gone at seven hours. And, and then the, the basic parameters that are handled a little better by the models, temperature, dew point, wind, wind gusts, we uh, tweak that in the next three hours only. And again, we've talked about the seven. The seven-day running average of the diurnal hour-to-hour -hour change is essentially what, uh, kind of like what Tim Barker does with diurnal from OBS, where he's averaging a period of time. And so Jerry just grabbed the seven-day running average. Uh, again, around here this time of year, we typically would go up three degrees from 15 to 16 Z on temperature. So given we wouldn't necessarily want to use a CLIMO. Uh, I guess we could use an average between CLIMO and the last seven days. We could do something like that, but we haven't yet. Uh, and so we'll tweak, tweak something. But again, that only has a big impact on temperature and dew point for the first hour or two. And then it's after that, it really it becomes very model driven. Next. So for sky, pop, QPF, and snow, the observed sky, QPF, and snow are advected along. Again, I guess I'm kind of hammering that so that we we remember that it, this is a fairly deep layer, and it does it works really well for mid clouds and deep precipitation systems. Shallow things like drizzle and lake effect and low clouds often don't work out too well. We've talked about deriving the pop from the QPF. Um, snow is created from the QPF, the surface temperature, and then the uh, caribou cob drive snow ratio. Kind of interesting, uh, there was a string that started in the last 24 hours talking about this very thing. Well, we, we use the, uh, the the Cobb drive snow ratio from the Smartinet uh, from the latest RAP 13 during the first 18 hours, and then a 50-50 average of the NAM GFS for the the last uh, six hours. And if you want details on that algorithm, uh, courtesy Dan Baumgard uh, gave me this link to the pa paper that uh, that illustrates it. We have been very pleased overall with the uh, smart init on the snow ratio and have used it as a workhorse for quite a while. It's it the one caveat is when you get stronger winds uh, you tend to you know per the rover technique you tend to get compaction and your ratios often with cold storms will be overdone. Uh, I didn't realize, and maybe Jerry didn't either, uh, Phil was talking this morning about how HPC has a snow ratio that's available in GFE. So we should probably incorporate that as well. So Jerry's shaking his head yes. So that I, Phil, thanks for that tidbit. I wasn't aware of that. Hey, Jeff. Yes. On your second to last bullet there, am I reading that right, that the rain-snow line is de determined only by the surface temperature? That's not correct. 
it's it's the entire it's the smart and it which looks at the entire column now I'm not an expert at the uh, Cobb snow ratio if someone else wanted but I can tell you I know from, from looking at it it zeroes out very close to the 850 zero line so I mean it it, ha it, it has very detailed information about the temperature profile with depth we also have a secondary check on surface temperature based on our grids that kind of accounts for, I mean, we've all seen situations where the model soundings are ideal until the surface, and then they may be off a few degrees. So Jerry also, in addition to the Cobb technique, check, and we have a slide talking about how he accounts for snow amounts based on the, the actual surface temperature we have in the grids. So does that, I know I'm rambling here, but does that answer your question? It is definitely not just the surface temperature. Okay, that's what I thought. Reading that bullet, I thought that seemed what it was trying to say, but I just wanted to verify that. Yeah, I, I, yeah it, it uses a combination of, of the uh, snow. It takes the snow ratio with the... What it really does is it looks at the snow ratio and the QPF, generates a field, and then it, that field is tweaked by an algorithm on the surface temperature, which we'll show on a later slide. Next. So here is how the uh, it computes the raw snow amounts. And then if the temperature is above freezing, uh, he uses that, that uh, algorithm to decrease the snow amount uh, to account for Melt, a wetter snow and melting and compaction. And then if your surface grid is above 36, it's not going to accumulate snow. Uh, so if you have one of those rare events, very rare events in my opinion, where it snows, you get significant accumulation with a temperature of 37 or higher, it's not going to, most of the time what you find is the uh, the melting term kicks in and the temperature rapidly falls from say 38 to 33 or 34 and you do get some accumulation. Next. So the way Jerry does this is the 1, 3, 6 and 12 hour grids at least for QPF are consistent. So if you, if you use 2, 3 hour QPF or snow grids, you're going to end up with the same amount as the six hour. So that's just, just something that we might want to make sure. Okay, next. Hey, Jerry. So I'll show you some uh, yeah. example. Yes. Sorry, Bobby. Um, I just wanted about the six hour QPF and snow. You know, um, current guidelines are that if you have a certain pop, you have to have QPF and all that jazz. Do you know, I don't know the answer to this, do you have to have QPF um, for every pop over a certain value at the hourly level? Is there any guidance on that? Well, at this time, there is no requirement to do anything other than a six-hour QPF or snow. So. What we have found, though, in our own local finalize is that if you, it's, 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 it was designed for a six-hour world, so if you have hourly pop and QPF, it, it'll, it will add or it will freak out and, and, and do th funny things with your grids. So my suspicion is that this is something we'll have to attack, but at this point, the ESTF, guidelines only talk about six hourly snow and QPF and so the my suspicion is if you do hourly products you will run into issues when you finalize depending on what your finalized script is like because we I have seen them here I think I think I'm hoping that answers your question I think so. The, the reason I ask is if you, you know, if you have a guideline that you have to have 
you know, every pop greater than 55 has to have a hundredth of an inch, and you do it hourly, then that means every six hour QPF is going to be minimal, minimally six hundredths of an inch, which may or may not be true. It's certainly not true in winter a lot. So you could end up with a huge Q, uh, positive bias on, on QPF and snow amounts. That, that's why I asked the question. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that behavior locally. Um, but it is a, it's, a, it's an interesting hit, and everybody's looking at me here because they can't hear the other end of the conversation, which in retrospect, I've done these talks before where there's a phone on and then there's a two or three second echo and I, I can't, I, I'm not able to block that out. So I apologize. They were just wondering about the, if you have a 60 pop for six hours, it's gonna th is it gonna throw in a hundred every hour in the finalized script because you have to required to have so you may only think there's gonna be a hundred, but it ends up being six hundred because each hour you, you see what I'm saying on this? okay so let's go this is the fourth biggest two day snow ever at at Madison and we'll show you examples of the six hourly snow the hourly pop and the hourly snow. So to remind you, this is the track. Uh, we had a period where it was deepening about a millibar per hour for about roughly 15 hours. Went from like 997 in southeast Kansas to 982 around Chicago. And hitting it one more time shows you where the swath of snow affected our area. Obviously, it went all the way from uh, back in uh, the Kansas, Nebraska area, crossed Iowa, and into, into. But I, I'm just uh, showing you the portion which was roughly greater than about 15, 12 to 15 inches in our CWA. Next. So again, the two-day totals, a couple of different maps, the uh, the uh, GFE version. Uh, once you start getting into the uh, dark blue, you're up around 9 to 12 inches. Uh, Madison is the 15, at least on this point, in the city, 15.6 inches was what it should kind of give you a reference. There's some white areas out around it where we had cooperative observers and reports of 20 inches or more. Uh, Moving on, so we got snow on the evening of the 20th. It started uh, around 8.30. By 10 o'clock, it was moderate. Had a uh, one-inch snow increase at 5Z. Went to S-plus for a couple hours. Had some, threw in some thunder snow with a couple of two-inch per hour reports, the 7 and 8Z. Then there was kind of a lull where it let up for a few hours to so fairly light snow. So this first round was very wet, uh, about a 10 to 1 ratio. So we had 8 inches with 82 hundredths of an inch of liquid from 0 to 12 Z. Next. The uh, next round, uh, another def zone set up, and it started to cool off and get windy. Uh, moderate to heavy snow for about five, six hours, had a few more one-inch snow increases, got kind of windy, so some of these OBS, they didn't report a snoiker or a snicker, as I, I remember when they used to spell it out with an O uh, on the snow increase. So this round was a little more typical wetness had a 14 to 1 ratio, another 7.2 inches on half an inch of liquid. Did we officially meet blizzard criteria? No. But it gusted to 30 knots for 12 straight hours. The visibilities were back and forth between half and a quarter mile in snow and blowing snow. So it's one of those typical tough to verify, even though the conditions, you get 15 inches of snow and 
12 hours of 30 knot gusts, but you can't seem to actually verify by the book. So a gust of 36 knots at 4Z. Next. So here's the 0Z run of consensus short, the six hour, uh, a, a six hour forecast. What I'm going to do on all of these screens is compare reality and the forecast. Um, you're going to notice some interesting things here based on the high resolution, low level temperature forecast of some of these models. Pick up the Mississippi River, They'll, you'll see uh, Lake Winnebago stick out real nicely, uh, which is just north of our CW. It touches the Fond du Lac area, which you see two zeros up in the northeast part of our CWA. The, the one on the right is Sheboygan, and the one on the left is Fond du Lac, and that the Lake Winnebago extends just north, northeast of of. Fond du Lac up into Green Bay's area. So you'll, you'll notice a hole in the snow amounts up there because, again, the lake was in the, the lake was pretty warm, both Michigan and uh, Winnebago, so the models were going above 36 degrees and zeroing out the snow, for better or for worse. On the left, uh, you see a K-Madison that shows how much liquid fell on that six-hour period and how much snow was measured at 1.9 inches. The uh, red is the forecast, which is one inch during that period for the consensus shore. And then for Milwaukee, which was mostly a rain event, uh, they had 1,800s during this period, uh, uh, just a trace. It brief, there was a brief mix of snow, and then it went over to rain. So they got, they were forecasting nothing, and they basically just got a trace. So you can see the heavy stuff coming out of Iowa uh, in the evening. The next slide shows the next six-hour period. Uh, in this case, and then on these, I, I threw in the observed 850 line using the SPC mesoanalysis, which is essentially a wrap, ruck-based uh, 850 line to show you how it actually verified versus the consensus of the model. So during this period, both, both locations get roughly two-thirds of an inch of liquid. The uh, forecast was for five inches of snow, and 6.1 was observed at Madison, nothing at Milwaukee. Uh, there was a trace, but essentially nothing. Notice it did an okay job of the 850-0 line in this case, but you'll see in later forecasts the models were a little bit too warm, which impacted snow. Notice also Lake Winnebago with um, only about an inch of snow forecast over the middle of it due to the warmth. Uh, and there's some hints especially in the far near the, just to the left of the 850 line as it goes off the screen to the bottom left, you can see some lower snow amounts along the Mississippi River, which is also caused by some of these greater than 36 in the model issues. And then going from 12 to 18 Z, here's where you can start to see the model having trouble, which is the same kind of trouble we would always have. It brought Several of the members brought the 850 line back west of Madison, which did not happen, which impacted. So the, the forecast snow amount was 2 tenths of an inch. You can see that just half a county west of Madison, there were 3 to 4 inch amounts forecast. Uh, so this was a period where the model would have underdone the snow I, again, the 850-0 line pivoted during the six-hour period, got right over Waukesha, and started leaning a little bit more northeast, southwest by 18Z, just to the northwest of Milwaukee. So Milwaukee got about half an inch of rain with no snow during this period. Madison, again, another 3.4 inches on 33 hundredths of an inch of liquid. Next. 
So that was the 0Z run. I wanted to show you uh, later the 12Z run, similar situation. Here you can see it starts to catch on a little better on the um, 850 zero line, but it's still a little bit too warm. So here it forecasted an inch rather than two tenths at Madison uh, when three inches fell. You can see just west of Madison there's two to three inch amounts forecast at this time in red and uh, green. Next, moving on to the 13Z run, which I, I'm not sure why I chose this, but um, here, the forecast for Madison was just about right on, and Milwaukee, you can see between 18 and 21Z, the, the uh, 850 zero line starts to collapse and is over Milwaukee around 21Z, uh, and then it actually goes off the screen into Michigan by 0Z. Zero the, the, Models did show a changeover, but they were a little bit slow, and our surface temperature forecast was also slow to go below 36 degrees, which also impacted the snow amounts. So, so another thing that uh, you'll notice that I forgot to mention, John, if you could go back to the observed snowfall for the event slide, which is uh, the one that I had a hand drawn and a there's a lake effect event that's or a lake enhanced event around Hurley. Hurley's way up in the north. There's ten inches of snow that fell up. Uh, I think some of that was lake enhanced, but maybe someone else on the call might. But it, it behaves sort of that way. Um, You'll notice that the model does a pretty good job of having about 10 inches in a fairly small area right there around um, the northern part of that county, which name escapes me. But it's a it it does show there's about three or four inches falling in that six-hour period up up in that that area, which. Was, uh, which is kind of a nice mesoscale feature that was still captured in the in this smoothed over analysis. So during this period, Milwaukee got mostly rain, but they got they did get an inch of snow before zero Z, which was not forecast by the consensus. It was kind of slow, and the models itself were they were a little slow to collapse the zero line. Next. There you can see a six inch amount in six hours up there in the Hurley area, uh, pretty well captured. And then the uh, heavy snow band is shifting towards Milwaukee. Our water temperatures and, and, and forecast uh, temperatures near the lake shore may have been a tad too warm because it did drop to 33 or 34 at Milwaukee. So you'll notice that the snow amounts were under forecast here. Uh, and looking at our, again, our forecast, we were a little warm, uh, which, again, the algorithm is going to take that into account. And also, it was the ratios were a little low there because it, again, was slow to move the zero line back. Next. And they see things kind of fade out. It was did a good job of shutting the snow off at Madison and still keeping light amounts, two or three tenths at Milwaukee during that period. Next. And then uh, just to show an update at 18Z, and I again drew the uh, procession of the zero line at 850. See here, the Madison model started to over forecast a little bit um, when the event had already pretty much looked like it was peaking at this time in Madison. Next. Uh, again, showing about an inch, uh, uh, showing about two inches when an inch was observed in the evening at Madison. Still got that lake effect event going up. 
uh, in the northwest. Uh, next slide. And winding down. I'm going to show you some individual hourly shots. This is pop. And uh, on the left is Madison hourly observed liquid and snowfall. And, and uh, and the pop that was forecast, and the and the actual um, forecast amount as well, which is which is we'll show on another slide. And then Milwaukee on the right. So you'll notice as we if you go through these kind of quickly to kind of show the movement. So that is based on radar mostly. You could see it moves some of the blobs kind of to the south. And then you gradually start to see an adjustment to account for a merging of reality into the model world. So the model starts filling in some of these areas that weren't actually snowing on radar. Still, you have, after a while, you continue to have categorical pops. and it, I will tell you that during an event, it will tend to reduce. Unless every single form of guidance has a hundredth, you're not going to get a hundred paw. So, but you'll notice that the amounts, as it gets drops down in the likelies, the precip starts to shut off around 50 pops at Madison and Milwaukee. Uh, the same thing happens. They didn't. They were still snowing, but we're tracing out at this time, which we'll show you on the next on the next set of slides. So see, it hangs onto the pops there in the lake belts in northern uh, Wisconsin. Here is the actual snowfall forecast, and I put the observed 850 line on here for comparison. On the right, I also show you the, the, the current top of the hour ob and temperature. So Madison's 33, half a mile in moderate snow, moderate rain at this time, and 41 at Milwaukee. And the, the hourly liquid is on the left, again, to, to compare between the forecast and what was observed. So they got a tenth this hour at Madison, and four tenths was forecast. You can see it's a little slow on the changeover from snow. It's uh, just behind the 850 line. What we observed is the 850 line was the rain-snow line in this case. Moving on, there at forecast six, five tenths, and we had six tenths of an inch at Madison. See now the 850 line is sneaking faster to the east probably effects of the melting term. Next slide. Here it's it's changing over just at you know, basically changing right over after twenty one Z as the eight fifty zero line goes by Milwaukee. Yet the mo the consensus at this point, four hours out, was about a county too far to the west on the eight fifty zero line. But you can see the orientation was was correct. Madison got another half an inch of snow with nine tenths forecast. Here, Milwaukee starts picking up half an inch of snow, yet uh, nothing is forecast yet. So again, an issue that we're hoping that the forecaster could catch on to these trends and maybe adjust the rain snow lines accordingly. Maybe find a better way to adjust the algorithm in this case, I think we were just too slow and too warm. Here, Milwaukee already picking up an inch of snow when the changeover line was just approaching uh, Madison. On this 18Z run, the forecast snow was a little overdone at Madison, so you notice a consistent over-forecasting of about a half an inch. Next. Here the zero line is completely collapsed, uh, and the, even the model showing snow at 
Milwaukee next. Storm starting to wind down in the evening next. Just continue to gradually progress. You see it starts to let up at Madison. A little bit slow to end the snow at Madison, maybe by an hour or two. Very good, just as you can see it. Keeps the lake belt going pretty well up there to the north. So summarizing what we found, I think that Consensus short does create realistic hourly snow grids. What we see is the usual timing and location issues. So what you see maybe off a couple, three hours or a county or two. Uh, so it, it does a pretty good job of representing things. Can you use it, uh, just load and go and not expect any issues? Obviously not, but I think it, it it's surprisingly good at, at generating trends that you can communicate to customers. Uh, the rain snow line is subject to model errors, and uh, we've, we only have a couple events to look at, but it, it's the same kind of issues we always run into with the rain snow line. It, it, uh, when you try to slice the slice the cheese this thin, you know, we, we're pretty good at looking at three and six hour ch changes, but when you do hourly, these lags can, they're pr they probably look a lot worse than they are. So another thing that is definitely an issue that I, I know that I've talked to some people that say that they're doing a better and better job with time in accounting for spin-up issues with precip with the HER, but if we don't get the HER until four to five hours after the run time, those improvements in the spin-up issues can't be harnessed in this product. Is So we still have to depend on uh, a kludge of doing our own precip spin-ups because we don't have access to the model soon enough. And again, I'm not sure if I'm explaining that the way I want it to come out, but uh, we need to work more on the observe precip fields. We've found some issues that become very critical. For example, the way that hourly precip is labeled on the labs and RTMA is an hour different. What, how it, when the, if you watch labs and RTMA come in, one is time, maybe time stamped for the same data at 4Z and the other is stamped at 5Z. Well, we have to, Jerry is doing a workaround for that in this code, but we have to make sure that, that, the, 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 our, the way that we label a time on an hourly QP, QPE is the same for each of these sources. Uh, MPE is very promising but only really covers your CWA. You only have access to your own radar's MPE. It's very good, but because you're trying to account for things coming in and out of your CWA, you have to use the lesser quality labs RTMA products in order to, uh, in order to move things in and out of your CWA. So these, are, these things are critical for spinning up these short-term pop QPF and snow grids because I think what we're trying to do is give forecasters something that as much as possible matches reality in the first few hours. And that is a big challenge. And that's, that's all I had. Um, should probably put, I probably should put this on speaker so my staff can hear the questions because that's been an issue up until now. Okay, while uh, Jeff works on that, uh, if you uh, have any questions at this time, uh, I believe we 
have a few minutes here. Um, we're up to about an hour so far. So, uh, Jeff, whenever you're ready, uh, just let us know. Okay, I've got I've got it on speaker, so Jerry Jerry can hear the questions as well, since he's the mastermind of the tech technology side of this. Okay, go ahead. Anybody that would like to speak up first. Hey, uh, <clears throat> Jeff, this is Gene. Um, during that uh, example you showed with that uh, winter storm back in December, again, how did it perform right along the lake shore? Because, uh, you know, for us in RCW way further north, uh, we really struggled with, um, you know, the snowfall gradients uh, along the lake shore, and, and obviously we had more mix and rain than uh, what we had forecasted uh, in terms of snow. So what are your thoughts on, on how to handle those uh, sharp gradients along along the lake, especially, you know, early in the winter? Well, in this case, I think that for the bulk of the event, it was very conservative with with uh, snowfall amounts. Now, granted, I say it over it under forecast at Milwaukee, but they only got a couple, three inches. And for the most part, it didn't for it just was a few couple, three hours late at and that some of that was our own fault because we, as you know, w once you get the uh, 850 zero line the, uh, and you get that deep melting layer, the melting term will quickly drop temperatures from mid to upper 30s to about 34 or 33. And then w with moderate to heavy snow, it'll accumulate. We, we, we kind of, you know, with our typical interpolation schemes, our temperature went from 37 to 36 to 35. That kills this algorithm because it, it really reduces the amount. And as you know, it, the drop is usually within an hour or so when it really kicks in the melting term. So I don't really know how we would do a better job of that. Um, I think that it, it, it was very it was very conservative and if you're worried about over forecasting snow amounts due to rain near the lake, I would think that you're not gonna run this is gonna be pretty conservative. Um, I know I'm kinda rambling here, but I don't have a good way to come up with those gradients near the lake shore uh, because I think that in some cases, it's much, it, it's much finer than even two and a half kilometer resolution we have in our grids. Right at the shore, it can be raining when at the airport in Milwaukee, which is not that far inland, it could have already gone over to snow. I'm not sure how we're going to be that good. I understood. Um, yeah, I, I thought overall, um, even with those limitations, um, what you showed was uh, pretty good. So, um, okay, very good. Thanks for the insight. I think a bigger issue is how many of us, we ran into this along the lakeshore before when it is a cold storm with uh, accidentally having people click near the shore and getting a lake and it shows no snow. This is, this, the way it is now, Things like Lake Winnebago and Lake Winona and Mendota around, around Madison, any place that you have a fairly large lake, the Mississippi River, it, in the early season, it's going to minimize snow amounts around those. So the tendency probably would be for forecasters to want to smooth that out um, because they don't want that kind of detail in. But frankly, until there's ice on the lake, it's not going to accumulate. So it's a, it's a real issue, but it probably doesn't give the message we want. So I see a lot of people smoothing those out and, and letting it snow over Lake Winnebago, for example. One last comment is we're, that we are testing consensus short in a few offices, uh, and it's, you know, there is a
long-term plan to disperse it to everybody. It will probably come after the full implementation of the ESTF, just FYI. Okay. Um, 